Good morning. Welcome to Christopher's Lifeboat. I'm Rain Story. This particular talk is on laughter and grieving. You know, it doesn't seem like the two fit. They seem like a complete dichotomy, right? How can you experience laughter when you're grieving, especially if you're grieving the loss of a child? How does that happen? How can you laugh? Why should you laugh? Is it even healthy to laugh? But more importantly, is it moral to find laughter and grieving? But you can only stay in that deep, dark place for so long, constantly. You just, you can't remain there. You won't survive. You cannot stay in that place for a long period of time. And laughter, whether it arises from a memory or present situation, it's the soul reaching out, searching and saying, I want to survive. I'm not ready to quit yet. Now, as for people who say that laughter and grieving at the same time is inappropriate, my opinion is be careful about letting people tie you down to a stigma or their perception of what grieving is or what it is culturally or socially acceptable in their eyes. Because if your soul, your deepest soul, is reaching out toward laughter and joy, crying out, I want to survive. I don't want to quit. I still see value in this life. It's a beautiful life. It's living, and I want to live again. I don't want to be grieving all the time. It's killing me. Well, let me tell you, laughter is life. Grieving is the heart, human heart, Yearning for a life that has already passed, this transition to something else. But life itself is laughter and joy in this present moment. And as human beings, we must have laughter. We must have it. So to those that say it's socially or culturally unacceptable to latch on to laughter or any kind of joy during bereavement or grieving, which is when we actually need it the most, well, they want to tie you down to their box of judgment. Um, You know, whether they mean it or not, they're manipulating your ability to survive. And in that way, they don't lose control of what they perceive as acceptable social behavior or cultural structure. So if you go with the box, you will undoubtedly get stuck in depression. You can't get out of it. And as, you know, This happens for some of us. You can even get stuck in the ever-recycling suicidal tendencies because we do try to stay tied to that box for so long. But we must have our hearts and our mind unbound and able to receive joy and laughter. It is truly the medicine that cures everything. Now, although losing my son almost took my life, I didn't really want to die as much as I thought I did. My soul was screaming out to live. And when my son Christopher came to me that night, touched my hair, the ghost of him telling me, Mama, I want you to live. I don't want you to be so unhappy and sad all the time. I'm okay where I am. You get out and go live. Do it. Do it for me because I can't anymore. And then he was gone. He was telling me to live, to appreciate every beautiful moment in living. He was telling me to find laughter and value and beauty in the life that was right before me. Because you know what? Eventually my life is going to end too. And why spend the remainder of that time that I have left here on earth in a completely devastated, non-functional, non-productive, and miserable state of being? Because my heart is hurting so badly. Complicated grief. Oh, yes, I have it. My heart carries the sorrow of losing my son every single day. And if I allow my mind to constantly look backward and re experience the crushing emotions of that day over and over again, then I am relinquishing the beauty and the power of the gift that is this moment. And I'm giving it to the power of the past. 
I have to continuously learn to recalibrate my thinking so that I can maintain a workable flow of my complicated grief alongside a meditated and deliberate focus on right now and my hope for the future. I have to take the controls and rein my brain back into the place where I choose when and where I can afford to have those moments of heartbreak and to release the grief that is now a part of me forevermore. I accept that. However, I don't accept that it must rule over me or my life or my relationships or my happiness or my quality of life. My son has, or losing my son has in itself forever changed that quality of life. But to give it the control and power over me to say that I can never be happy again is to succumb to death. Complicated grief cannot have that kind of power over my life. No, I take my power back and I determine when and where it is okay to express and release those emotions in a safe place. Complicated grief, or CG, doesn't get to call those shots anymore. To submit to CG and let it have total power over you, that's not survival. It's completely unacceptable. What my heart really needs in order to maintain control and survive is this joy, this laughter, peace, and love that I have deep inside myself and all within those around me. And as for those that will tell you that laughter and grieving are incompatible, wrong. No, that's not true. And I mean that in the most kind and affectionate way, but seriously, they either haven't walked in our shoes and don't understand, or they have been in our shoes and themselves submitted to societal and cultural rules and regulations that stifled their ability to heal. And they feel that's the way it should be. And for these, I feel empathy. But please, don't let them set your standard. Don't let them tell you how you must grieve and what is acceptable for you. Now, I understand that some of you feel that you're committed to your communities and your cultures and your societies, and therefore you must adhere to those rules that you are judged by. And I am not by any means condemning your culture. However, I do think that there is a way that you can appease the cultural expectations and norms and still find laughter and joy without being overly suppressed. It just means that you will need to create an avenue outside of your cultural realm in order to do it and find healing through joy and laughter. And this avenue, you know, may be a private space just to yourself, away from the judgment and eyes of others. But we must find laughter. We must find joy. This is the medicine that will begin to heal our wounded and suffering souls. This is the medicine that will get you through until the end of your life. Now, in the beginning, when you first lose your child, it's going to be very hard. The hardest thing you have ever faced in your life. And I tell you from experience, it's going to be very, very hard. You're going to feel that you're not going to make it. And there are going to be moments when you think you don't care whether you do or not. Oh, there were many times that I thought I wouldn't survive this. And laughter was the last thing I wanted or needed. And for over a year after my son died, I refused laughter. Partly because my heart wasn't in it and partly because I didn't want to be perceived as a horrible mother. Laughter and joy would come right up into my face and say, come on, take me by the hand. I want to heal you. And I turned my back and say, no, I can't. I don't feel like laughing. My heart is breaking. I don't even want to think about healing right now. And in doing that, I caused myself some detrimental health issues, and I chased some racial relationships away. A lot of negative things resulted from that choice to cling so tightly to the heart-wrenching torture of losing my son and to refuse the laughter and joy when it approached me and tried to heal me. In the beginning, it seems like there is no way out. It feels like you are completely trapped to the torture and horror of repeating that loss over and over again. That you need healing, 
whether you feel like you do or not, it doesn't mean that the laughter is going to just come in immediately. But at some point, you have to make the decision that the healing must begin. And to do that, you have to find more positive ways to cope in your heart and in your mind. You're going to find your own path through this. And be careful not to let others dictate what that path must be. You have to find it. And Christopher's lifeboat's here to give you the tools. Cost you nothing. And laughter is one of the tools to help you heal and find the joy. And guess what? It's free. And the beauty and the joy of life that is still right in front of you will begin to surface. Again, for me, the devastating loss of my son nearly took my life a couple of times. And I did not care. But as time went by, I realized that there's so much beauty in this life. Everywhere I turned, by taking a hike, riding my bicycle, walking my dog, I could see flowers blooming and hear birds singing as a cold, soft breeze washed over my body. And I really realized at that moment I had become so tone deaf and blind to those things before. And then I began to see, with a much greater appreciation, every little aspect of life right in front of my nose. Life is so precious and so fragile, and it is right in front of you. We tend to be hurried and look right past it, look right past it. We spit on it, we toss it away, we step on it, we say, oh, well, that was not much of anything to take note of. But through my son's death, I learned such a wondrous appreciation for every tiny, tiny little detail of life and living that I had never been able to see before. I had become accustomed to hearing my own laughter or allowing myself to feel any joy. I denied myself that because of my grief. And the first time that I heard myself laugh, it caught me by surprise. What was this strange bubbling up of joy from within me that I alienated from myself? And I realized that by making that choice, I was keeping myself sick, unwell and unhealthy, and not functioning at my best or even close to it. Laughter is good for the soul. That is absolutely true. Yet there are so many physiological aspects that need to be considered as well. There's the chemical reactions that occur in the brain, the dopamine and other chemicals that are released when we choose to feel certain emotions. In a very literal sense, our choice of emotion is affecting our health. It's very true. And laughter and joy are necessities to who we are as human beings, and they have a dual purpose in our lives. First, they are hardwired into our essence spiritually, emotionally, physically, and they are simply crucial for our existence and survival. Secondly, their presence, or lack thereof, determines our quality of life for whatever time we have left on this earth. They determine if we're happy or miserable. And guess what? Oddly enough, that is our choice. But laughter is a must. No human being can withstand high levels of heartbreak and sorrow that we experience as grieving parents for an extended period of time. If we try to maintain that level, we We either die rapidly or we live a miserable existence. And there are two main reasons why I believe this is a very wrong choice. To deny laughter and to stay stuck in misery and stress. It's a bad choice because, number one, we can't handle the constant high level of heartbreak and neither can those around us. This choice affects every single relationship that we have in our lives. Every single one. Now think about that for just a moment. Is it fair to those that love us so and wish us healing? The fact that we refuse it. 
Is it fair to make them cry because of concern for us? Is it fair to force them to watch us slowly suffer and kill ourselves? Is it fair to expect them to burden the stress of our choice to remain in torture? Now, the second reason I believe it is a wrong choice is because personally I feel that the choice to continue in that perpetual state of madness and suffering is to choose to not appreciate the precious life that we have inside of us. This comes down to the issue of gratitude. To choose to hang on to and linger in a high level of heartbreak and grief is in essence to turn our backs on the simplicity of gratitude. To turn our backs on the very beauty of the tiniest gifts of life, like a butterfly, a flower, a child's laughter, or an elderly person's smile, or even a homeless person's thank you. Think carefully for a moment. Gratitude is crucial in mental and emotional health, and because it affects the chemicals that our brain releases into our bloodstream, it, is also, it also hugely affects our physical health as well. So you see, the choice and the benefit of choosing laughter and joy doesn't just benefit us directly, but it also affects those that we love and care for indirectly. It absolutely affects every one of our relationships. Here's your sign. If you feel that people are alienating you or distancing themselves from you left and right, it's usually because they just can't handle the choice you've made to hang on to that high level of heartbreak and sorrow. However, when you choose to allow yourself to experience laughter and joy, you begin to attract laughter and joy and positive relationships back into your life. And these relationships are and will be the support net that you need. They see that we're trying and healing, and therefore, because they love us and care for us, they want to be a part of our healing and support, and they want to assist wherever they can without feeling that they have to distance themselves because of so much intense pain. Laughter is healing. So despite what the socially or culturally accepted norm is, and we all had them, we are all still the same. We are all human beings. This is a small example, but once I was told that I was not a very good mother because my dark path of grieving should never end. And if I loved my child, that's how I would behave. And then on another occasion, I was asked, your son is dead. Why are you still alive? This idea that I must not have loved my son much because I didn't choose a permanent path of total misery and heartbreak for the rest of my life is complete absurdity. It is simply because I do love my son so much. And still to this day, and because I have a deeper sense of gratitude for living, that I choose to love my life and heal my life and help others find the same whenever I can. So because they are blind, they cannot see that their belief is actually absolute opposite in truth. It's because I love my son so much and I appreciate his life and my life. So much that has made me appreciate life in such a new way that I have never experienced before. And gratitude in everything. So in what time I have left on this earth, I will choose gratitude and healing and helping others in every way that I can. And that is my purpose here. Laughter and joy are life, are living. So despite what other people say, I'm telling you that this is the truth. Find your own path. In our grieving, there is a mountain. These are the multitude of deep, hard emotions. Every emotion, hard, soft, good, bad, all at once. You know it. It's a mountain and it's enormous. 
your emotions are all on edge all at the same time. And the mountain just keeps swelling bigger and bigger. You're suppressing all of it. And it's like your nerves are exposed to ice water all at once. You're touchy and everything sets you off because you have no release, no safe place, no idea where to start. If we can rein in those emotions, as well as all of the caring, loving, and compassion that causes us to grieve in the first place, isn't it our love for our loved one that causes us to grieve? But then somehow take this mountain and try to shape it and make it into something positive. It's like making your mountain into cookies. Small little dollops of something good. You don't like cookies, make cupcakes instead. (laughs) How do we make cookies out of our mountain? Well, you take a dollop here and a dollop there. And all good choices here, folks. Not everyone likes chocolate chip. Not everyone likes pistachio. And then you don't like cookies or cupcakes, make muffins. Just remember that we only really like the tops. So here we go. Dollop, dollop, dollop. Dollop of emotion, a dollop of smiles, a dollop of random kindness. Dollops of empathy, dollops of care, love, peace, joy. And let's give that now away to others. That's right. You give it away to others for two reasons. First reason. Dollop by dollop, it helps us release the pressure cooker of pin-up emotions that we're suppressing. And this will greatly facilitate our healing process. A cookie, a cupcake, a muffin can be a smile to somebody else who appears sad. A dollar bill to a homeless person. Helping someone across the parking lot with groceries. A hug to a lonely elderly person. You never know what they may be going through. And although it's hard to imagine, they could be suffering more than you. We cannot know unless we take the time to reach out, listen, and share. And in doing this act, it helps us release a dollop of pressure and tension from our own situation in the most productive and positive way possible. Now, don't be tempted to hoard all those emotions of cookies to yourself. It's not a healthy choice, and that will only result in a negative path. It'll just take you back in a circle to where you were before. Now, the second reason that we want to give these cookies away, because it manifests gratitude, empathy, care, love, peace, and joy, that we want to attract back to ourselves for healing. And gratitude, folks, means doing it even when you don't feel like doing it. It is a deliberate act that over time becomes a lifestyle. It's crucial for self-healing, but I guarantee you won't be sorry. By helping others, we in turn help ourselves, and this is how human beings are wired to be. But to start off, we have that mountain of emotions, stress, events from surroundings in our lives whether it be political, family, friends, work, survival, daily drama. We all have those things. But all of these things in our lives add up to create a mountain of emotions, and now we heap on the added struggle of grief. Losing a child, a spouse, a loved one. These powerful emotions of loss, especially that of losing a child, is almost unbearable. So we have this mountain of emotions, huge mountain. We cannot let it continue to swell and grow without releasing some of the pressure in positive, constructive ways. Thus, the cookies, the cupcakes, the muffins. Meanwhile, those other dark, black, negative emotions, release those through therapeutic outlets and express them away. Choose art. Try writing. Try painting, dancing, acting. There's so many ways to do this in a healthy way. And you have so many choices to begin. But you have to choose to do it and then just do it. 
So whatever the therapeutic outlet is that you choose, choose it, find it, and do it. And in this way, you won't harm yourself or others, but you release the, release the pressure in the pressure cooker. And you begin to heal. So laughter and grieving, is it a dichotomy? Or is it something that is more of a collaboration? I choose a collaboration. This is the end of this recording. Thank you for listening. Have a wonderful day. And please find your laughter today. <laughs>